Please join with me in turning to the book of Hebrews, chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, as you're turning there, let me give another reminder of something that I had mentioned last week. If you are a member, if you are a member here at Founders Baptist Church and you have not yet signed the church covenant, maybe you weren't here last week or maybe after making a mental note you said to yourself, I need to sign that covenant when I leave this morning and then we go through a worship service and you forget about it and you leave. Again, the tables are out in the front foyer, the covenants are there to sign, and we're going to follow up on this for all those who are members and have not signed the covenant, and it would really lower the the labor intensity if you would help us by signing that covenant if you haven't already. So if you're not sure or you know that you haven't, again, the tables are out in the front foyer and the the church covenants are there. Hebrews chapter 9 is where we are this morning. If you're visiting with us, we've been studying our way through the book of Hebrews. We have come to this ninth chapter, and we have arrived at verse 15, and we're reading this morning down to verse 22. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. God's Word says this, Therefore, therefore He is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal covenant inheritance. Since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Let's go to our God together and ask his blessing on this time we have in his word. Father in heaven, we want to acknowledge at the very outset that we are absolutely and completely dependent upon you. In this next hour, nothing will be accomplished that is of any value or worth unless you accomplish it. And so we look to you, Lord, for the preaching of your word. We ask you to strengthen me this morning and to help me to declare your word in a way that pleases you and in a way that is good for your people. And we want to acknowledge at the outset that we never learn anything unless you're the teacher. We may gain information, but our minds are not changed, our hearts are not transformed unless you, Lord, are at work in the teaching, in our hearts, doing that work in us. And so we look to you this morning as learners, and we ask you to be our teacher today. We realize, Father, that sitting in front of us are some who don't know Jesus, And our desire, our longing is to see many converted in these days, many brought to faith in Jesus. And so we ask you to be at work through the preaching of the gospel that today men and women, young people, might be reconciled to you by faith in your son. And your precious bride sits in front of us this morning, your church. And today we need encouragement and we need correction and we need strengthening and your word is sufficient for all these things. Your son is sufficient for everything that we need, for life and godliness, for now and for forever. And so we ask that you would minister to your church today. And that in all of this, you would be exalted, your son would be magnified in our sight, we would be humbled, and in a fresh way, Lord, devoted to you. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is no news to you 
that Christianity has its critics, and not just a few of them. In fact, the whole world is full of them. And many of those criticisms come, well, I could say it this way, those criticisms come from a number of different points of view. What they all have in common is a hatred for God. What they all have in common is a dismissal of the Bible, a dismissal of the Christian faith. But they come from many different angles. One of the criticisms that that have been voiced throughout the ages is the idea that Christianity represents something primitive, something barbaric, something offensive to sensible people. Sometimes it's been said this way, Christianity is a bloody religion. Barbaric, superstitious, primitive. What kind of approach to God could be based on death? What kind of religion would require the sacrifice of a man to purchase the release of men? What kind of theory would have the creator of the world making an entrance into that world that he made and taking to himself a human nature and then dying on a cross? It's a stumbling block, the Bible says to Jews, the message of the cross. It is foolishness to the Gentile world. When people talk like that, when people think like that, what they have missed, what they refuse to embrace is the dilemma that man's crimes against God represents in terms of how God could be both just and the justifier of ungodly people. Man's fall, man's crimes against God, God made a promise He said, the day you eat of it, you will surely die. So man's crimes against God, all of them, each of them, and all of them, what they deserve is death, the death penalty. How can God uphold his justice? How can God be true to what he has promised regarding sin, that it will be punished with death? How can God punish sin with death and be merciful and kind and loving and forgiving toward those who've committed those crimes? How can God be both just and the justifier of ungodly sinners? That's the dilemma that sin has presented. That's the dilemma that the gospel had to answer. Romans 3.21 says this, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law Although the law and prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift. Let's just stop there for a moment. What is he saying? He's saying that salvation is received by faith alone, and it's a gift. To be declared right with God is a gift. To be forgiven of all your sins is a gift. And it's received by faith. Just faith. But how can that be just? How can that be right? Well, the passage goes on to say this. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. You see, it's by the death of Jesus. It's by the blood of Jesus. It's by the sacrifice of Jesus that the penalty of death has been executed by God upon sin. And at the same time now, the way is open for God to freely forgive those who will believe that, who will come to his son and receive his son by faith, who will accept, who will receive God's sin sacrifice on behalf of ungodly sinners. Receive Jesus and you're forgiven. And your sin hasn't been brushed under a rug. It hasn't been ignored. No, it has been punished in full by death. But the death has not been experienced by you, but by a substitute, by the Son of God. That's the good news of the gospel. 
And he goes on to write this, this was to show, this was to demonstrate God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. We'll talk more about that this morning. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, here it is, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God's justice upheld, God's grace extended. And when you understand that, when, you, when the Spirit of God allows that truth to really break in upon your mind and your heart, this bloody religion becomes a beautiful religion. Though it is ugly when you think about all those Old Testament sacrifices, and then you think about our Savior hung on a cross rejected, mocked, crucified. It is ugly. But from the standpoint of divine grace, it's beautiful. The bloody religion becomes a beautiful religion when you understand what Jesus was doing and how the justice of God is upheld and the grace of God is extended at the same time. This is the amazing story of redemption. It's the story of the gift of life that depended upon the gift of a man who would die, whose nature, whose character, whose perfect obedience meant that his death would be sufficient to atone for all the sins of all those who would place their faith in him. In fact, his death is of sufficient value. It would atone for a billion worlds besides this one. A deliverance that depended upon a sacrifice, a forgiveness that depended upon a punishment, a covenant that could only go into effect after the death of the one who made the promises represented in that covenant. That's the beauty of the gospel. That's the beauty of the death of Jesus. And that's what the writer of Hebrews focuses on in our verses. He's been telling us that Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant. And here in our verses, he tells us that the inauguration of that covenant, the beginning of that covenant, the establishment of that covenant required nothing less than the shedding of his blood. The new covenant could not be established without the shedding of his blood, without his death. And so this morning, once again, Jesus is set before our eyes, and he's presented to us in three ways in verses 15 through 22. Here's how we're going to look at it. First of all, we're going to see Christ the mediator. Christ the mediator. We see that in verse 15. Christ the testator, verses 16 and 17. Christ the testator, verses 16 and 17. And then Christ the purifier, verses 18 through 22. The purifier. But we begin this morning with verse 15. Christ the mediator. Therefore, the Bible says, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. And we've noted several times throughout our study of Hebrews that the preeminence of the new covenant is explained by the preeminence of Jesus. It is the greatness of his person. It is the greatness of what he has accomplished that explains the greatness of what we receive in the new covenant. The new covenant is better in every way than the first covenant. And the reason why it is better is because Jesus has actually come and fulfilled everything the first covenant pointed forward to. The first covenant was preparatory. It was, it was a foreshadowing of what we have now in all of its fullness because Jesus has come. The first covenant involved the mediation of God's revelation by means of angels. And Moses was a mediator of sorts. But Christ is greater than the angels, and he is greater than Moses. And the covenant that he has mediated is greater than that first covenant. The greatness of his person explains the preeminence of the covenant. That is not in any way to diminish that first covenant. It had its God-ordained purpose, 
but it is to point to the fact that that has been fulfilled and the new covenant is greater. And so here Christ is presented as mediator and we're told three things in verse 15. We're told what he has done, we're told why he has done it, and we're told how he has done it. What he has done, why he has done it, and how he has done it. Begins this way, therefore, therefore. Once again, tying us to the previous section. He's wanting us to look back immediately. Verses 13 and 14 have to do with what he's about to explain. Verse 13 says, For if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of a heifer sanctifies for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? What has he told us? That the death of Jesus accomplishes something that the animal sacrifices never really could. They, they served as symbols. They pointed forward to what he would really accomplish. He came and actually accomplished it. That is the forgiveness of sins and the release of our conscience from guilt. Christ's death really answers for sinners. Christ's death really answers for our guilt. Christ's death really answers for our sins. In Jesus, it's not symbolism. In Jesus, it's reality. But his death did something else. This is the something additional in verse 15 and following. His death also meant the inauguration, the establishment of the new covenant. Therefore, therefore, in light of that death, he is the mediator of a new covenant. This is what he has done. He has mediated a new covenant. And in this particular context, that word mediator is not, even though Jesus does stand between man and God, he mediates in that sense. What is really being emphasized here is the idea of establishment. He is the mediator in that he is the inaugurator. He is the one who established this new covenant. This is what he has done. Why did he do this? Why did he do this? And by the way, what the writer's wanting us to see as he explains all of this, is the significance of death in the inauguration, not only of the new covenant, but in the inauguration of any covenant. Why the death of Jesus is necessary. You see, maybe he's writing to people who are, who are somewhat scandalized by the idea of a Messiah who died as a cursed one on a tree, I mean, really, the Messiah was to be crucified? He had to die? This is a stumbling block for the Jew, and it's foolishness, foolishness to Gentiles. So why did Jesus have to die? That's what he's explaining, and he's explaining it in terms of opening this new way that the people of God would relate to God. Later on in Hebrews, he's going to write about this, Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brothers... Since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. I mean, by his death on the tree, this new way was opened for us. That's what the writer's saying. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and bodies washed with pure water. He's saying we can really draw near to the Lord with, a, with, the, with the awareness that we are really accepted. We are really clean. We are really forgiven. We are fully accepted. And it's the death of Jesus that has opened this new way. No longer, no longer worshiping by means of a temple, by means of a human priesthood, by means of animal sacrifices, by means of ritualistic washings. No, now we approach God in Jesus, in Him. This is all that's necessary. We are the Lord's temple. He abides in us. We are the Lord's worshipers. We are the true circumcision. Our worship is acceptable to God. Not because we're going through these rituals, but because Jesus has satisfied everything that the rituals pointed toward. This is a new thing that Jesus has done, and his death was necessary. 
for this. So this is what he's done. He's the mediator of a new covenant. Now, why has he done it? Verse 15, so that, might want to underline that, he's the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. And the idea there is possession, the promised eternal possession. That right there that I just read, that is the key statement For this entire section, verses 15 through 22, you, you want to circle that in your mind or in your Bible because that's the key statement. Here is why Jesus came. Here is why Jesus had to die. Here's what he did it for. So that those who are called may receive the promised eternal possession. I can say to you this way. God made salvation promises. Jesus came to make them real. God made salvation promises. Jesus came to make the promises good. Those promises you can trace all the way back to the book of beginnings. You can go all the way back to Genesis 3.15. And there is the promise of a redeemer. And then God made a covenant with Abraham. And in that covenant is the promise of worldwide blessing. That's going to be brought to pass because of this one who will come from Abraham's loins. In this seed of Abraham will the whole world be blessed. And then that Abrahamic covenant plays out in these other covenants that God makes. Finally culminating in the promise of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31. The writer of Hebrews has already dealt with that. And all of these promises of God now have been actualized. They have been made real. And Jesus came in order to do that so that those who are called. Now, when he's talking about the called there, he's talking about those who come to God through an effectual calling. He's talking about those who hear the good news, that sinners can be made right with God based upon God's provision for their sins. So God calls through the preaching of the gospel, but the called here are those who actually hear the promise of the gospel. God has opened their hearts He has drawn them to himself. It is an effectual calling in view here. So these are are believers. The called is just another way to describe those who by God's grace have become believers. Jesus came to this earth so that those who are called would actually possess for eternity everything that God has promised in salvation. That's why he came. So that those who are called may receive, may actually receive, may actually possess, may actually have the promised eternal, everlasting riches that God had planned, that he destined for all those whom he determined to save. We can say it very simply. God determined before time, in view of the fall, that he would save a people. He chose those people whom he would save before time. And those people whom he has chosen to save, he calls in time and history through the preaching of the gospel. And those whom he calls, he justifies. And those whom he justifies, he glorifies. So that salvation's unbreakable golden chain runs from eternity past to eternity future. This is something God has determined to do for his glory and in great kindness and mercy and grace. And Jesus had to come to make it all real. What has he done? He has mediated a new covenant. Why has he done it? So that those who are called would actually receive the things God promised. So how did he do it? Next statement, verse 15. Since, since a death has occurred that redeems them. What does the word them refer to? The called. So that this death redeems the called from the transgressions Committed under the first covenant. Transgressions there. Serious stuff. Violations of the law of God. 
crimes against God. You see, this is the dilemma. This is what the gospel has to solve. Crimes against God, deserving of death. I must suffer death or someone who does not deserve it, whose life and person and character is of sufficient worth to not only pay for all of my sins, but all the sins of all those who will ever seek refuge, refuge in God by faith in him. He would come and die in my stead, in my place. You couldn't die for me. You deserve death as much as I did. I couldn't die for you. I deserve death as much as you do. So what God did is he sent his only son into this world. And that son, that eternal son, took to himself our own nature, yet without sin, and lived a life of perfect obedience under the law of God, so that he did not deserve death. And there he died on the cross in the stead of, as a substitute for, all these sinners who would be saved by faith in him. A death has occurred that actually redeems. A death has occurred that actually purchases, pays for wipes out, obliterates, forgives all the transgressions that have been committed against Almighty God. And notice the writer wants to emphasize here that Christ's death answers retroactively. Isn't that what he says? He says, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed when? Under the first covenant. So there you have these people sinning against God under the Mosaic Covenant, under the law of God. What do they deserve? They deserve death. They deserve death. And every time you brought an animal sacrifice into the tabernacle or into the temple and that animal, sacri- that, that animal was put to death, slaughtered there. And this bloody religion took place so that blood is poured out. And then blood is sprinkled on all sorts of things, as we'll read about in a a moment. What is happening is that every single step, sinners are being reminded visibly, tangibly, concretely, this is what my sin deserves. I deserve death at the hand of Almighty God. But He is willing to let a substitute answer for my sins. And yet those animals could never substitute for your sins. So how could God justly allow you to go free when the only thing that has been sacrificed for your sins is an animal? How could God justly forgive you when the only one who has ever suffered for your sins to this point has been an animal in terms of that execution of the divine sentence of God upon sinners. How could he do this? The answer is all those animals were accepted by God on the promise of his son. So that when Jesus came and died, he was not only dying for all the sins of all those who would trust in him from the day of his death forward, But he was answering for all the sins of all those who had trusted in God's provision for their sins backward, all the way back to the very first believers. All the way back when when God clothed Adam and Eve with the skins of animals, when they deserved to be executed on the spot. All the way back to that first sacrifice, Christ's blood answers for all of those sins. What has he done? He has mediated a new covenant. Why has he done it? So that all those whom the Lord has destined to save will actually receive everything that God has promised in salvation. How has he done it? He has done it because a death has occurred that answers for all of our sins, both past, present, and future. Christ, the mediator. Second picture of Jesus we see in verses 16 and 17. And now he switches gears. He moves, in in my view, and I'll just say this quickly, verses 16 and 17 are a battleground for interpreters, all right? And there are at least three different positions that have been taken on these verses. I'm not going to go into all that this morning. I'm just going to give you what I believe is here. What you have in verse 16 and 17 is a switching of gears. He moves from the realm of the religious to the realm of the legal, okay? He's going to return again to the realm of the religious in verse 18, but here he, he wants to give us an analogy, It's just an analogy. Notice what he says. For where a will is involved, 
The death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Do you see the word will there in verse 16? For where a will is involved, it's the Greek word diatheke. It's the same word translated covenant in verse 15. That's why you have this debate around these two verses. Is he talking about a will as in a last will and testament, or is he talking about a covenant? Is he still carrying on the same thought, for example, as what he had in mind with respect to the Mosaic covenant, is that same idea here in verse 16 and 17. What makes this interesting is that that word diatheke is used outside of the Bible to refer to a last will and testament. So he's using words that could refer, or a word, that could refer to a covenant or could refer to a will. And I think in these verses he's talking about, and the translators of the ESV reflect this as well, he's talking about a will, like like a last will and testament. So he is picturing Christ not just as a mediator, but as a testator, as someone who who has made a will, I mean, think about how a will operates in our culture. And it has operated this in all sorts of cultures throughout the history of mankind. Here's what happens. I, in view of my death in the future, I make out a will. And I say, what, what I have to give, the gifts that I have to give when I'm done, here's how I want them distributed with respect to the people whom I love. This is, this is how I want my possessions divided. This is how I want my interests distributed. That's a will. That's what you do. And as long as you're alive, that will is in your possession. It reflects the the determination of one person, right? The people who receive the benefits, they don't make the will. They don't write it out. They don't negotiate with you. You write out the will. It's your will that is being expressed. And as long as you're alive, it does not go into effect. It is not in force, But after making out that that will, when you die, now that will goes into effect. And what the writer is saying is the death of Jesus is analogous to that. God made salvation promises in times past. Promises that you can count on because God doesn't change. His mind doesn't change. His word is always fixed. It is as good as if it it has already happened. But nonetheless, in order for that to be actualized, for that to go into effect, a death had to occur. The death of the one who made the promises had to take place. And that's what Jesus did. That's why his death is necessary because upon his death, now the new covenant was ratified, actualized. Verse 16, for where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. You don't distribute the stuff until you're sure the person is dying, right? For a will takes effect only at death since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. It's just an analogy, but it's a good one. It reminds us of how the death of Jesus has actually brought about something new. Christ's death was decreed from all eternity. This is not plan B. This is plan A. This is what God planned all along. So his death was decreed from all eternity. The salvation of the elect was decreed from all eternity. The the eternal possession, the eternal inheritance for those elect people was determined from all eternity. And God promised it all from the very beginning, but it was not until Christ died that any of it was finalized in time and history, actualized. Christ the testator. And now we come to the third way that he presents Jesus to us, verses 18 through 22, Christ the purifier. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated Without blood. Echinizo is the word translated inaugurated there. It means to bring about the beginning of something, to ratify something, to establish something. So he's saying not even the first covenant was ratified, established. It didn't begin to, to, to be in force without a death, without blood. 
Verse 19, for when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. Stop there. He's saying, he's saying this is how the first covenant was kicked off. This is how it was inaugurated. This is how it began, with the shedding of of blood. Exodus 24 describes that for us. Moses came. Exodus 24 verse 3, the Bible says Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules, and all the people answered with one voice and said, "All the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do." And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning, and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and, and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people and they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. How did the Mosaic Covenant have its beginning? With blood, with the sacrifice, with sacrifices, with the application of the blood of offerings. But notice, that's not only how the first covenant began, that's how it functioned. When you think about the worship of the people of God, the place of worship, the utensils that were used in their worship, these things were purified, they were, they were ritualistically cleansed through the death of sacrifices. Verse 21, and in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Now, this came after the inauguration of the, the first covenant, the, the construction of the tabernacle and all that. So, so the writer's not thinking in terms of he did this immediately. He's pointing out this is how the, the covenant began and this is how it functioned. This is how the worship of the people of God was made acceptable to God through the death sacrifices. And so the tent was sprinkled and the vessels that were used in worship were sprinkled. So if you think about God relating himself to men, he's making this covenant there at Sinai. It's not without blood. And when you think about men approaching God in worship, it's not without blood. In fact, he says this in verse 22, indeed, under the law, Almost everything is purified with blood. Just stop there. So, so we're asking a question at this point, aren't we? Why? Why, why do you inaugurate a covenant with blood? Why do you, are you sprinkling blood on a tent and on all these utensils? Why is, is it true to say that almost everything is purified with blood? Why such a bloody religion? Well, he answers it, doesn't he? End of verse 22. And without the shedding of blood, there is no what? Forgiveness of sins. You want to know what the problem was when you talk about God relating himself to men? The problem is sin. You want to know what the problem was when you talk about men approaching God in worship? The problem is sin. Do you want to know why there's death, 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 death all over the old covenant, all over this approach to God? Why so many sacrifices? Why so much blood? What message is God sending forth to humanity with this kind of religion? Your Crimes deserve death. And there's no way for me to be made right with you. And there's no way for you to worship me unless your sins are paid for with the death penalty. It's the only way. So that the sight of death and the smell of death and the interaction with death was constant. Sin deserves death. And the life of any living creature is in its blood. And so when the blood was shed, it speaks of the penalty of death. Why is the writer bringing this up? He wants us to see something. All 
of those sacrifices, all of that shed blood, all of those demonstrations of death were symbolic. They were temporary. All of those things really represented a promise. A promise that someone is coming who's one offering of himself will answer for all these crimes, for all these transgressions, for all these things that stand as a barrier between man and God. God will uphold his holy justice. Your sins will not be ignored. They will not go unpaid for. But this same God will demonstrate his great mercy and grace and love in that he is willing to take his own punishment upon himself in the person of his son and take your place, stand in your stead and experience his own wrath upon himself in the person of his son so that you can go free And in that way, a new approach to God is inaugurated. No longer a temple or a tabernacle, no longer priests, no longer animals. But now we have direct access to God through our one mediator, our great high priest, and his name is Jesus. And his death is answered for all of our sins. So that get this, not only does his death speak of the inauguration of the new covenant, his death speaks of the cleansing of the worshiper and the sanctifying of all the worship that they offer. We are clean, and our offerings are acceptable. And it's because of this one death that atone for it all. And doesn't, it doesn't make us clean for a time. It makes us clean for forever. Is that not good news? So that now the bloody religion is beautiful despite all its ugliness when you understand what it signifies. You know what it screams? Grace. Grace. You deserve death, but there's grace. And this grace can be known only in the one who died for sinners. The only way to meet God on the ground of grace is Jesus. There's no other way to meet God on the ground of grace but Jesus. And good news, sinner, he's enough. His death is enough. R.T. France wrote this. He said the Levitical laws are based on the belief that sin cannot simply be brushed aside and forgotten, but that it needs to be atoned for. And the prescribed method of atonement is by the shedding of animal blood. See especially Leviticus 4 and 5. According to Leviticus 17 and 11, blood represents life. And its shedding thus represents life poured out. When an animal dies in a person's place, its poured out life is accepted in the place of the death earned by the person's sins. It is this basic Old Testament principle to which our author appeals to explain why the final perfect sacrifice made by Jesus on our behalf also needed to be a blood sacrifice. Anything less would not be taking the problem of sin seriously. John Piper said this, This is the best news in all the world for us who feel our guilt before God and know that our righteousness is wholly inadequate to win God's favor. The good news is that God in his great love has made a righteousness available to all who will find their confidence for life in Jesus Christ. We cannot work for this gift so as to earn it, merit it, or deserve it. But it is there for everyone who hopes in Christ. Romans 4, 4, and 5 make this plain. To the one who works, his wages are not reckoned as a gift but as his due. And to the one who does not work, i.e. does not try to earn, merit, or deserve God's gift but instead trusts him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is reckoned as righteousness. The good news is that there is free acquittal for the guilty who stop trying to impress God and men 
but instead rest in Jesus. There's no human drug or salve that can ease the conscience of the guilty like this truth can. Oh, how I hope you take it for yourself and set out from this place with Christ clean today. That's my prayer for you, my friend, that you would set out from this place with Jesus and that you would be clean because you have trusted in him. You have rested your whole case for acceptance with God. You have rested your eternal outcome on the truthfulness of God's promise of eternal salvation if you trust in his son. Have you trusted in Jesus? Is this bloody religion beautiful to you? Have you seen what God was doing when his son was hanging on that cross? And do you know that he's been raised from the dead so that he's able to save forever? Anyone, everyone who will approach God trusting in him. If not, would you give your life to him this morning? Would you give your life to Christ this morning? Would you, would you know the forgiveness of all of your sins today by trusting in Jesus? And then, dear church, can I ask you, when you see such a great salvation, when you see such a price paid for your sins, I wonder what kind of life that should produce. I wonder what kind of devotion should be the response to that. Oh, not that you would earn it, not that you would ever deserve it. You can't. It's infinite in value. But that it would be made plain by the way that you live that you really have received it and you really are grateful. Eternally grateful for Jesus and that you love him and that he is now your life. For to me to live is Christ. And only then will you ever be able to say, and Death is gain. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, what can we say to these things? Oh Lord, what a great salvation it is that you have provided for us who are by birth in Adam ungodly sinners. You have justified the ungodly by the death of your Son. Lord, I pray for anyone in this room who doesn't know Jesus, may they even now from their heart cry out to you, looking to your son for the forgiveness of their sins. And I pray for your church that, Lord, we would see the unbelievably ungrateful nature of what it is to live for anyone or anything else when Jesus died to purchase us for God. May we confess together today that Jesus is our life and may our devotion demonstrate it. I pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.